kind enough today to bring some packages of vocation books. So if you'd like to take one with you, I'm going to leave the prayer right on that, uh, the card, rather, right on the desk. So please help yourself to one or two. Um, they are available at the gift shop. Where's Loretta? Oh, there's you. They're available online at the gift shop, at the uh, website, the Washington Province website. So, as we do all things, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you promised that if we agree to pray for anything in your name, you will do it for us. Through the powerful intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, we ask you for the grace of good vocation. Give us young men and women of faith who are zealous to become your strong friends and to faithfully serve as friars and nuns in the discalced Carmelite order. As we gather today for this day of recollection, please bless all present and bless all of those who couldn't be here but are here with us in spirit and all of those who work so very hard to make this special day happen. Bless the good people of St. John's Seminary for their hospitality and for so graciously welcoming us into their home. Bless all seminarians, Lord, especially those studying for the priesthood here at St. John's. We ask your blessings today upon Father Donald as he instructs us in your name, Lord. Open our ears and our hearts so that we may receive your spirit through him today. Under the guidance and wisdom of our Lady of Mount Carmel, please grant continued vocations and blessings upon our beloved OCDS order as we seek to glorify you in the world as secular Carmelites. As you have in the past, Awaken our hearts to fervently desire you and to carry on the charism of Carmel, to glorify the triune God in the company of your mother, and to be loved at the heart of your church. And we pray and ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, welcome back to the audience. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Thanks, Paula. Is this not working? Test one, two, three. Is this working? Test one, two, three. Not working. St. Modern and Maravillas, who was the uh, founders and uh, refounders of many of the Carmels in Spain after the Spanish Revolution. And uh, as she was discerning a call, she had an uh, uh, interlocution of our Lord, uh, and it was Proverbs 8.31, My delight is to be with the sons of men. And she had this awareness of the Trinity living within her. And uh, then she had another one later on, refound all of the Carmos. My delight is to be with the sons of men as she would refound the Carmos uh, to be instruments of God's presence. And I, I thought of the best person regarding the presence of God to focus on. Uh, it's like boot camp. And, uh, you know, in every sport, there's a boot camp. 
Uh, so in, in basketball, when I practiced, we never even played a game for two weeks. We just did boot camp for two weeks. It's called basketball boot camp. Uh, baseball has a spring training. So this is kind of kind of this is kind of talk is kind of like Carmelite boot camp. Uh, it's back to some of the basics of Brother Lawrence, uh, who's a simple uh, uh, friar, as they say. Um, in 1614, uh, his name was Nicholas, and he was baptized in the church in a little village in Lorraine. Um, we know hardly anything about his family background. Very little about his education in this rural environment. However, there was one event that marked his life, and it's in the conversations in his book, um, and it's the first conversation. On a, a one winter day at the age of 18, while contemplating a free script of its leaves and reflecting on the cos cosmic reawakening that takes place in nature every spring, which is happening here in Boston, Nicholas was seized by a profound sense of the divine presence, of the divine providence. And that source of life that never ceases to reveal itself. And his intellect was filled with an entirely new light and an awakened faith. God became close and present in all things. And this would be engraved in the depth of his soul. Now, life was really difficult in Lorraine in his time. There was a terrible war, uh, which was destructive and murderous and immoral. And he enlisted in the army in that really troubled period, and he lost this beautiful vision that he had at the age of 18. Uh, he would grieve often over the sins he committed between the age of 18 and through this war period. I don't know, they, they never, he never says exactly what they were, um, but he says them often in his conversation and, and his letters. Uh, and in 1635, he was wounded, and uh, he, he was brought back to his native village. Uh, his body was restored, and this is where his soul also recovered. He met a hermit, and he wanted to go and live a solitary life. But that was really not his path. But as he was praying, he moved to Paris, and he was at the service of a very prominent man. But that wasn't what God wanted him to do either. And through these difficult circumstances, Nicholas, as a young layman, knew life and he knew the world. He struggled in his life. He survived through a, a war. He was in many difficult situations. He experienced poverty. He experienced famine. He also discovered the weakness of his human nature, of his sins, which he was really conscious for for the rest of his life. But love would triumph. And uh, Nicholas uh, remains uh, an example of the spiritual awakening and uh, slow resurrection. And finally, he met the community of Discalced Carmelite Friars in St. Joseph's Convent, located on the Rue de Bogard, in June of 1640, at the age of 26, he entered as a lay brother. And as he entered as a lay brother, um, after two months of postulancy and two years of eviction on August 14th of 1682, on, on the eve of the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, he pronounced his vows as a lay brother. So that's be 42, sorry. A difficult beginning, but a great joy. And uh, his, uh, as he made his life his way into this new life of Carmel, filled with new, new challenges, new people, new duties. He knew that grace was waiting for him. And to this he wrote, his principal concern throughout the more than 40 years he has been in religious life has been to be with God. And to do, and to do say, or to think nothing that could displease him. He has no other interest than the pure love of God. And this is a quote that he reiterated to a religious priest. On my interest into religious life, I made the resolution to give myself entirely to God in atonement for my sins. 
and to renounce everything else for the sake of the, his love. During the first years, I ordinarily thought about death, judgment, hell, paradise, and my sins when I prayed. And continued in this fashion for a few years, carefully applying myself the rest of the day, even during my work in the practice of the presence of God, who is always near me, often in the very depths of my heart. That gave me great reverence for God, and in this matter of faith alone was my reassurance. I gradually did the same thing during my mental prayer, and gave me great joy and consolation. This is how I began. However, there was a difficult side to his experience. He said that for the first 10 years, he suffered a great deal in this. He felt that he didn't belong to God, that his, fat, his past sins were always before his eyes. And during this period, he said he fell often, but he got back up just as quickly, he said. It seemed to me that all creatures, reason, and God himself were against me, and that faith alone was on my side. I was sometimes troubled by the thoughts that this was the result of my presumption, that I pretended to be all at once where others were able to arrive only with difficulty. Other times I thought I was willingly damning myself, but there was no salvation for me. When I accepted the fact that I might spend my life suffering from these troubles and anxieties, with no way, which no way diminished the trust I had in God and served only to increase my faith. I suddenly found myself changed all at once, and my soul until that time always in turmoil experienced a deep inner peace if I had found its center and place of rest. That's the key letter. And so the first 10 years of his religious life, we can assume that that would be uh, the, the uh, as St. John of the Cross would say, the dark night of the senses, and most likely the dark night of the spirit that he went through. In the last 30 years, he had this great peace and this great union with God. And he was so in, enveloped with the divine presence of God that he thought of God so often that he had constant help in every situation. And he had this all these great inner consolations. And if he did become forgetful of the divine presence, this is what he said, God would make himself known immediately in his soul. And he'd often go back to himself. And this would happen when he'd get engaged with activities, because he was obviously a cook and doing a lot of um, uh, physical things for the, for the primers. And he responded completely to this inner call. And always and lifting his heart up towards God. And these experiences, experiences made him so certain that God always is in the depth of his soul, that he had no doubt about it, whatever may happen. And so he, to know uh, St. Uh, Blessed Lord's of the Resurrection, we have a, obviously his beautiful book, Practicing the Presence of God, which is um, a, great, uh, a great classic. But just a note of his personality. Um, he was from the country, so he was a simple uh, worker. He didn't like compliments, and, and he didn't like beautiful formulas. Uh, often people would talk about his good virtues, but his virtue never made him unsociable. In other words, he was always open to others. He spoke freely, but he spoke directly. He was always what he it was always simple, it was always on top target, and it was always full of common sense. I always liked that uh, common sense part. G.K. Chesterton said, when mankind falls away from God, they lose common sense. <laughs> this man had common sense. Uh, and through this rough exterior, though, you have a, a lay brother that was um, affable, simple, modest, and had a high, high regard for those around him. He was a cook, and um, and he was 
as they say, rough by nature, but sensitive by grace. And one friar said, I had an excellent conversation with him about death while he was very ill, and yet he was very cheerful. So one of the letters I'm going to start with um, is uh, his second letter. There's a whole section of them. But one of them is that, that is very profound, that I find very good, is the second one. And in the second letter, it is, he, he writes, in a conversation some days since with a person of piety, he told me the spiritual life was a life of grace, which begins with a servile fear, which is increased by hope of eternal life, which is consummated by pure love, that each of these states had a different stages by which one arrives at last at that blessed consummation. I have not followed all of these methods. On the contrary, from what I know, not what, not on in, not from instincts, I found those discouraged me. This was the reason why, at my entrance into religion, I took a resolution to give myself up to God as the best satisfaction I could make for my sins, and for love of Him to renounce all besides. For the first years, I commonly implored myself during this time set apart for devotion to the thoughts of death, judgment, hell, and heaven, and my sins. Thus I continued some years applying my mind carefully the rest of the day, and even in the midst of my busyness, to the presence of God, whom I considered always as with me, often as in me. And so that was his method. And since uh, then he continues on down the road, such was my beginning, and yet I must tell you that for the first, first ten years I suffered much, the apprehension that I was not devoted to God as I wished to be. My past sins always present to my mind, and the great unmerited favors which God did to me. Then moving on, when I thought of nothing but to end my days in these troubles, which did not at all diminish the trust I had in God, which served only to increase my faith, I found myself changed all at once, and my soul, which till that time was in trouble, felt a profound inward peace, as if she were the center of place of rest. And that was uh, the heart of his, uh, his spirituality, and that, would, that was his, kind of his method of his uh, life is the holy presence of God through his life. And uh, as he went on into his uh, writings, he would write and he would say, if I were a priest, I would preach constantly on the presence of God and the reality of the presence of the Trinity, and I would encourage all in the confessional uh, to make that their practice uh, in their spiritual life. That's how uh, dedicated and assured he was of the pr practicing of the presence of God. Now, uh, I want to, um, uh, we could go on more and more with his uh, letters and stuff, but I want to move to something um, that I was giving a retreat, and uh, every now and then you open the floor to questions, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. <laughs> And uh, I got you got a question, and sometimes you get a question, and the question was a really sincere question. It was from a secular Carmelite. How do I become more generous to God? It's a simple question, um, and it's a great question. And so this is a question by a Carmelite, by a Catholic, and so it's fair to assume that this person is praying and loving, and. Um, and that person is uh, a person who is inflamed with God, as many of you are here. And um, it's a question that, uh, how do I become more generous? And it's fair to say that souls desire to grow and progress. And if that soul didn't desire to grow and progress, they wouldn't have asked the question. And it's a revealing and significant question because God is generous. And he has infinite generosity and we have the ability to be like God. So we have the ability to have generosity too. God's infinite, our soul's infinite, so we have an infinite capacity for God. Uh, and those who are drawing close to God will experience God in prayer. They'll experience a desire to be more generous, to grow, to progress, to change. So how do we respond to the soul 
How do I become more generous? Well, you can substitute the term and you think it's best for your circumstances. I think generosity is going to be particularly helpful for us. For those who are experiencing God in prayer, it'll be a situation that will sometimes will be clearly defined. God's asking something of you, and uh, sometimes we have to surrender that what God is asking us to God. And that's a simple generosity. That's give God what he asks. Give God that which he asks for, surrender, turn it over to God. Now, there's a second category, though. And that's where the fog of uncertainty sets in. Where we're not going to know what God is asking with certainty. We're not going to know what God wants us to surrender or to give. Now, in that fog of uncertainty, it's clear that, in, you know, there's spiritual direction and various things through uh, priests or sisters or whatever that can help guide in that situation, but the response would be simply to live the gospel generously. The first instance, there's certainty. The soul knows that God is asking this, and the soul will have to respond to what God gives, and God what, what God wants. The second circumstance is where you're uncertain, and there's fog. But the response is to live the gospel generously. Now, how do I live the gospel generously? How do I do that? Most of you hear the gospel on a daily basis. How do I live the gospel more generously? Well, I suggest the answer is provided by St. John of the Cross. And it's also in the scripture and it's also in the mouth of Jesus Christ. How do you live the gospel more generously? And St. John of the Cross describes what will limit our generosity to God. What will limit what will limit Limit your generosity to God is, and living the gospel generously is that called the appetites. Appetites. What are they? So, appetites are just another word for desires. So, um, if, um, if you take the word desire and you desire something, um, then you're having an appetite for such and such a thing. Um, but we can say, well, I have a desire for this or that, but one desire is better than another. How can you say that you can't compare Shakespeare to Charlie Brown? I mean, <laughs> saying peanuts is better than Shakespeare, you're living kind of in a different thing. So the desire to help someone in great needs is great desire. Uh, I have a desire to mow the lawn. But the desire to help someone in need is greater than the desire to mow the lawn. Now in our era, what happens in people is they, they process all their thoughts as if every desire is the same. They can't distinguish a lot of times a, a different desire from a, one desire. You go to colleges and say, gee, you know, I got a test tomorrow, but I desire to go to the movies. So I go to the movie. No, you got to study for your test. They, they process everything in one, one desire is equal to another desire. They have, no, they have no ability to distinguish hierarchy of desires. For St. Teresa and John of the Cross, um, if you go to Ascent 3, number 16, there is a hierarchy of desires. And that's called the greatest commandment. You shall love your God and yourself and your neighbor, and that's the greatest desire. Loving God. That's all from Deuteronomy. And this is a desire that St. John of the Cross is a commandment for. And St. Teresa of Jesus says we all have the capacity to speak to God, and we'd be a fool if we didn't speak to God. So there's an immediacy that she's saying that we have this desire, we have this capacity, and if you don't do it, you're going to be a fool for not doing it. So for John and Teresa, there is a hierarchy of desires. And prayer is letting God uh, love us. And that's uh, St. Elizabeth Trinity, let yourself be loved. That's not always easy, though. It's not always, le uh, not always le easy letting yourself be loved. Look at Brother Lawrence. It took him 10 years. He was letting himself be loved, but it took him 10 years to get through that. For St. John of the Cross, it's important to define what a human being is. Because as a human being, God made us with desires. 
Now, my dog Jack has desires. He desires to eat. He loves turkey. <laughs> he has certain desires. Uh, he desires to go to the bathroom. He desires to be fed. And he desires to sleep most of the time. <laughs> but his desires are different than our desires because his desires are based on instinct. We have free will. So the desire is about freedom. So for the John of the Cross, the desire is about freedom. And so if we get the desire wrong in our free will, then we lose our freedom. And so the desire to freely choose God is the highest desire. St. Therese said, I desire to be a saint. That's a good desire. That's the highest desire. So for St. John of the Cross, a human being is someone who is free. Now, we as human beings have a lot of temptations, at least I do. And we as human beings can get things wrong. For St. John of the Cross, the beatific vision in going to heaven is not simply God doing something, but it's, um, it's a reciprocal thing. I have a part in this. A person can say, you know, I don't want to go to heaven. We have the freedom to do that. I think it'd be stupid, but you have that freedom. So we have ability to have bad freedom and good freedom. It's a reality because we have desires. But ultimately, the highest desire is the freedom to choose the God. What's causing the desire? We have a desire for food. Okay. Uh, now, if you ate um, some bad food, and you've got food poisoning from that food, bad food, I think we'd have a natural aversion to going back to wherever that place was and that particular food. We would not have a desire to eat it. So there's something behind everything in, the, in our desire. Some food is more repulsive than other foods. But what is common is you have desires. And what is common is you have an appetite for food. Because we have a need to eat. And we identify the appetites because we have desires. And we only have desires because God gave us capacity to have desires. Now, let's, uh, I have a, a friend of mine, she's blind. And uh, she desires to see things. And she should have the capacity to see. But she doesn't have it. But she has a desire to see. So for St. John of the Cross, when we're looking at the soul, and we're looking at him as a human, when he's looking at a human being, uh, in the soul, that soul has capacities and abilities. And that soul has the ability to speak. It has the ability and desire and power. He calls them appetites. And I have the appetite to see. I have the appetite to speak. We have the appetite because we have desires. For St. John of the Cross, it's important that he makes two distinctions when he comes to appetites. First, there are voluntary and involuntary appetites. Um, there are some appetites which involve free will. There are others that have no free will. You call it instinct, if you wish. Somebody comes at you with a knife, you, uh, you, come, you come with the right cross. It's uh, just a natural instinct of, uh, that we have to defend our life. Uh, there are others where um, we, we uh, have appetites where, um, that are part of our lives, that we make a choice and they're voluntary, where there's freedom. Look at the capital sins, they're um, seven deadly sins, they're, they're voluntary appetites. We can go from, we can be prideful, we can be gluttonous, we can, we can voluntarily do all of those things. Uh, and so when you look at the appetites for John of the Cross, they're either working correctly or they're not working correctly. If they're working correctly, they're in order. He doesn't say much about that. But if they're working incorrectly, they're called disordered appetites. And this is one of the main points uh, 
And then he died.